What do you hear the most from them? Is it that Regina is a strong, independent, outspoken woman living by her own rules? Is that what resonates with people, do you think? I think what really resonates with people is that good can come from broken. In Once Upon a Time, we encounter villains who are complex, colorful, and charismatic. Out of all those, perhaps none illustrates better the beauty of transformation than does Regina Mills, the evil queen. You said you wanted to change, to be better. This is how. You want me to have faith in you? Have faith in me. Regina's growth is simply mesmerizing to watch. In the course of seven seasons, she goes from wanting to kill her stepdaughter to becoming best friends with her. From slaughtering people Kill them all. to saving people. From oppressing and enslaving her subjects Take him to, my bed chamber. to liberating them. She goes from casting curses to breaking curses. From trying to use children for her own needs to putting their needs before her own. From exacting revenge on her nemesis. Should have killed you when I could. And now. And now I can. To showing them mercy. I won't kill you. Instead, I'm gonna give you what I got. I'm gonna give you a second chance. Although she's introduced to us as an unapologetic tyrant. And above all else, with every ounce of my being, I regret that I was not able to kill Snow White. We come to know her and love her as a benevolent ruler and hero. Once upon a time, you were a villain, Mom. But you've changed. You're a hero now. Her journey invites us to ask important questions about happy endings. Don't you want me to be happy? Of course. But not like this. My happy ending looks like Snow's head on a plate. No! One question worth asking is, is self-made redemption the best way to a happy ending? I want to. Much of Regina's growth process may remind some viewers of Christian mortification, which is a fancy term for the Christian practice of putting one's sin to death daily. Regina, I've seen what life has thrown at you, and you still fight against the darkness every single day. Much like a Christian, Regina fights her darkness continuously. The main difference, however, is that for Regina, mortification must be waged by her own strength. So do as I do. Learn to live with it. Welcome to my world. Which isn't the case for a Christian. For a Christian burdened by the weight of their sin, there is a Redeemer who literally carries that burden for them. And it isn't that Regina lacks help entirely. It's just that that help is not a sufficient one. There's no savior in this town anymore. And for all the healthy perspective Regina gains, My enemies became my family. And that's when I finally felt happy. And her honorable ownership of her crimes. Everything that's happening, it's my fault. I created this device. It's only fitting that it takes my life. At the same time, she gains a deep discontentment about her seemingly never-ending struggle. I know I did the right thing. I know because I'm miserable. Again. Much of this unrest stems from her morose view of cosmic justice. Well, whoever's guiding all this seems to think it is. You're the hero, and I'm the villain. Her baggage, her karma, call it what you want, will always be there. As well as her often performative motivation for doing good. If you do good, hoping to be redeemed isn't really good. What Regina cannot perceive is just how deep that rottenness goes. The core of ourselves that we don't readily acknowledge. Having that darkness inside of them and those crazy thoughts that we have that we never ever utter. This uncomfortable to admit disposition that we're born with has a name in Christian theology. Total depravity. Total depravity is the idea that people are born totally depraved and therefore in need of rescue. Or as the Bible puts it, there is none righteous, not even one. 
There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. And once upon a time, total depravity is not a reality. I always believe that evil isn't born. It's made. Evil isn't born, dearie. It's made. Evil isn't born. It's made. So it does make sense that in Once Upon a Time, inner darkness is dealt with by simply diluting it. But even the show makes clear that there is a problem with that. Even though he separated himself from the darkness, the capacity for evil remained. It can grow back at any time. There is no guarantee of permanent redemption if, indeed, the darkness is like a tumor that just keeps coming back. The darkness likes how you taste, dearie. It doesn't mind the bitter. And now that it started the meal, it's gonna finish it. But what if permanent redemption were possible? <laughs> what a novel thought! What if this curse of darkness that we're born with were breakable? Every time I try, it just blows up in my face. It's like I'm cursed or something. According to the Bible, it is. Apostle Paul wrote, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. This substitutionary atonement, which redeems the believer once and for all, functions almost like a true love's kiss. True love's kiss will break any curse. And only our souls, one true love, can give that to us. But do we want it to be broken? The curse? I think you broke it. No, no. Any curse can be broken. Who told you that? If we're honest about it, the answer is no. We love the darkness. Because I loved it. Many of us are only one socially unacceptable step away from embracing our darkness completely. My first impulse was to rip his throat out. Regina's story exposes how desperately helpless we are. I'm trapped. What Regina needs, you and I both need. The true Redeemer. One who doesn't turn us away. One who's able to understand our temptations. I can't imagine how that feels. And empathize with our failures. We know how you are, and who you will always be. One who can help us, although we can't help ourselves. Having a Redeemer who has broken the curse completely means not having to constantly prove your righteousness for others to see. How am I supposed to prove to people I've changed when you're there to chirp in their ears and remind them of my past? It means that the Redeemer knew how bad you were and yet still paid for your crimes anyway. Now some of us may still be thinking, we can do without this kiss, that happiness is simply a matter of self-empowerment. And I'm not scared of anything. That even when things look dire, all we need to do is hold our heads up high. So you be happy. It's time for you to believe in yourself, Emma. It's time for you to find hope. Blind hope will not save us. You say good always wins? It doesn't. Hoping in other people to be our saviors will disappoint us. But living hope won't. In the biblical picture of a happy ending, we find that our desire for happy endings is a memory trace. A trace from our original state, in which God and man walked together in naked love and harmony. People were without shame and without guilt. They were free. But wanting to define good and evil on their own terms and replace God, man declared independence from God. And man has been estranged from God ever since. The idea of a happy ending shifted. Since when do I care about anyone else's happiness but mine? From being God-centered to man-centered. I did it. We appropriated happiness. And it's time the villains got their happy endings. And by violating God's good design for happiness, we lost our way. No more happy endings. The only way to be restored is to return to that garden relationship which can only be done by embracing the kiss. We must declare to him our moral bankruptcy, that apart from him, we are wretched and without hope. But this change of heart, acknowledging that there was a war you were waging against your creator, cannot be done by our own strength. I don't care about justice anymore. 
we can't be reconciled to him by simply trying harder. What are you doing? He's apologizing. We cannot get better until we see that the curse is real. Is that if the curse is real? We don't need self-empowerment, but deliverance from ourselves. Stop! Our only hope is the true Redeemer, who can take the scales off of our eyes. No one's ever been willing to die for me. No one you can remember. This, and only this, can restart our unbelieving hearts. But when we try to be good on our own, in our total depravity, when we try to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, it's like trying to give that kiss of redemption to ourselves. And not only is that exhausting, it's exhausting. but also impossible. <laughs> I just had to stop you. I have no interest in cleaning tongue marks off my mirror. If we're really under a curse, we need nothing less than a miracle. What does she need? A miracle. Then it's no wonder that no amount of therapy or rehabilitation can ever get rid of this toxicity in us. You know, a curse isn't a curse anymore when the afflicted wants it. The Bible calls our default state being dead in our trespasses. As a result of being separated from him, our entire race was infected by brokenness and death. God saw this and didn't leave us there. He came down to us himself, clothing himself with humble human flesh to atone for our evil. And whereas the first representative of the human race had failed to obey God, God's only begotten son, Jesus Christ, who was both fully God and fully man, obeyed God perfectly by living the life that you and I should live and dying the death that we deserve. Or in the words of prophet Isaiah, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. When we try to do good works to revive ourselves, What are you doing? It's okay. You're safe now. They're actually dead works. You said you liked it here. Not like this. No one can resurrect themselves. We need someone from outside of ourselves. You saved me. The author of life. When your redemption is God-made, it is based on an eternal foundation, the righteousness of God. A savior who forgave you, not because of anything good that you've done. Remind me again why we forgave her? Because I'm helping but because of what he did on your behalf. And this Redeemer not only saves his sheep, but he promises to keep them persevering to the very end, as it is written. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good, to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ. Pastor John Piper, in his book, Pleasures of God, writes, But the gospel is the good news that God is the all-satisfying end of all our longings, and that even though he does not need us, and is in fact estranged from us because of our God-belittling sins, he has, in the great love with which he loved us, made a way for sinners to drink at the river of his delights through Jesus Christ. He was not obliged to do this. He was not coerced or constrained by our value. He is the center of the gospel. The exaltation of his glory is the driving force of the gospel. The gospel is a gospel of grace, 
And grace is the pleasure of God to magnify the worth of God by giving sinners the right and power to delight in God without obscuring the glory of God. But grace is often misunderstood as something that can be earned by good works. Which doesn't mean that you can't earn forgiveness. A chance at grace, I have to believe that. I have to believe we can earn forgiveness. A chance at grace. I needed to believe I could still earn forgiveness, that I had a chance at grace. But with every heartbeat, every warm and wonderful meal, every waking moment, we only go into deeper debt with God. The good news is that God paid the debt for His people Himself. Grace is unmerited favor. Here is a glorious description. For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, so that we would walk in them. In other words, God's people are not saved by good works, but for good works. And although He can rightly smite us with His justice, God is patient with us. He sustains the rebels who scorn His authority and bring Him dishonor. Ow, 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 my ankle! Set me down gently! Seriously, you're complaining about how I saved your life? <laughs> the justification that comes through Christ means that those who repent of their sins and put their trust in His finished work on the cross. God declares them not guilty. Although we are sinful before a holy God, once clothed in the righteousness of Christ, righteousness that is imputed, we stand innocent in God's court. This glorious exchange is possible because Jesus Christ, who was the only truly innocent person, volunteered to be the scapegoat for His undeserving people. Through Christ and His merits, we can stand faultless before the throne of God. It's tempting to think that we can manufacture happy endings by simply settling down comfortably in our world. My happy ending is finally failing at home in the world. But in the next breath, we will realize that that feeling has vanished. That feeling was uh, the closest I'd ever been to happy. There is no happy ending without happiness himself. There will be a hole in our hearts. That can leave a hole. A what? A hole. An emptiness. And this hole is a God-sized hole, which we try to fill with other things. As an early church father, Augustine writes, Because you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. Nobody gets it. It's like there's a piece of your heart missing. It's no accident that the Brothers Grimm wrote of the original Queen in Little Snow White that, back at home, she asked her mirror, 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 on the wall, who in this land is fairest of all? It finally answered, You, my Queen, are fairest of all. Then her envious heart was at rest, as well as an envious heart can be at rest. Until our hearts do find true rest, we'll always be thirsty for true happiness, and we'll make things other than God our everything. Whatever else I'm supposed to do with my life. I'm your mother first. Because without that, I just don't know how to be. Such attempts at redemption make us fall prey to hypocrisy. What about forgiveness? What about redemption? I mean, you've been forgiven, you've grown, you've changed. You're not me. Do you forgive me? Oh. Mm, let's just say I understand you. As well as despair. There's no redemption for me. There's always suffering. In a self-made redemption, righteousness is always a performance. How do you do it? Do what? Live with yourself, knowing all the bad things you've done. And redemption, a scorecard. But to get there, we have to be the best people we can. Work, spread hope and faith every day, because otherwise what we did will stain us forever. And such self-righteousness can never truly become real repentance. 
I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I killed the evil queen's mommy. And I said I was sorry. And I didn't mean it. Because it never deals with our core problem. Brought into the core. What exactly does true repentance look like? The true redeemer went through hell on that cross so that his sheep won't have to. God became a curse for his people. Repentance that is acceptable to God is repentance that grieves the affront one caused God. Or as Psalm 51 says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. I cast a dark curse. Did it give you what you wanted? For a while? Turns out I wanted the wrong things. What if Regina had known the true shepherd who pointed her to true contentment? You and Bell seem content. <laughs> because I took it. And quite frankly, you should uh, stop moping and do the same thing. The true friend who was strong enough not to lose heart. Why couldn't you just go through that door and meet your soulmate? Was being happy such a terrible fate? Yes, yes it was. The true advocate who taught her the true meaning of grace. Lucky for you, you've earned enough goodwill with me to give you one last chance. The true husband who looked after her before himself. And I am reminded of your dearly departed mother, who, like you, truly was the fairest in all the land. The perfect father who never let her down. Oh! Mother! That might have changed everything for her. True redemption is more than making amends. True redemption is about being brought back to life. God made redemption, made by a God who has seen your worst and still loves you the same and shepherds you into glory. That redemption gives us true joy and true peace. For the Christian, union with Christ means becoming one with the Savior you love, the source of all joy, the true lover of her soul, and the end itself. Christina, you are my future. Once upon a time is right to show that good can come from broken. But those who have been plucked from the fire by Christ, who have been redeemed God's way, should be able to add, yes, good can come from broken, and good has come from broken. And because of that, we have true hope. Hope you enjoyed my video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment.